All right, it's 12.01, so um, just be respectful of everyone's time. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, Cassie, for uh, admitting people in the background. Appreciate that. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to uh, our first webinar, uh, which is Elevate Your Outreach, Strate Your Outreach Strategies webinar. My name is Fraser Wick, and I am the program analyst for the Wildfire Risk Reduction Program. For, those, for today's presentation, Lauren Street, uh, with the uh, Central Oregon Intergovern Intergovernmental Council, COIC, will present uh, her OSFM funded and uh, project and highlight the organization's work to enhance outreach among diverse groups and hard to reach communities. These are often groups that are that are overlooked and may uh, or may not have a seat at your table when you're planning or executing projects within your communities. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, you know, today, uh, this is the first in a, in a series of grant webinars that we're going to be doing. Um, we will have a second webinar on February 14th to discuss risk and liability for OSFM grantees. Um, all of these webinars are really directed for grantees, but they're also great for anyone that has grants um, or receives funding uh, from other uh, areas. Uh, it's always good information to, to hear. Um, so before I hand it off to Lauren, uh, I'd like to remind everyone to please mute, mute your microphones. Um, and then we will be monitoring, I'll be monitoring the chat and uh, I'll facilitate a Q&A session after Lauren's presentation. Um, if you have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat and we will get to it at the end. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Lauren. All right, thank you so much, Frazier, and thank you everybody for joining. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen over here. As Fraser said, um, I my name is Lauren Street, and uh, I work for the Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council. Um, Fraser, can you see the slideshow all right? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I help to run and manage um, our OSFM funded project. It's the Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership. Um, and this uh, partnership spans across uh, two different organizations. So the organization that I work for, um, COIC, Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council, um, as well as the Heart of Oregon Corps. Uh, and both of these organizations um, have youth crews um, and young adult workforce programs um, that and those crews are the crews that we have working on on our fuels reduction projects. Um, I uh, so our this program spans across the Central Oregon region. Um, and when we were first developing this program, um, we looked at where the high wildfire risk was and we overlaid uh, the social vulnerability index map with those high risk WUI areas. And we came up with our seven uh, target areas uh, that we wanted to focus on. So our target areas are in Lapine, uh, Prineville, Juniper Canyon, Crooked River Ranch, uh, Madras and most of Jefferson County, Camp Sherman and Deschutes River Woods um, just outside of Bend. Um, so those are the seven target areas, and that's kind of how we came up with the scope of where we would focus our work in. Um, we um, so this this allows us to work within these underserved communities um, that are based off of that social vulnerability index map. Um, this project that you see in the background of this picture here that is um, up outside of Crooked River Ranch. Um, this is actually a project that we um, assist the Forest Service on. Um, <clears throat> and before we get too far uh, into the scope of what we do um, with this program, I would like to back up and talk a little bit um, about the program outside of the OSF OSFM funding as well. Um, we started this program, the Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership, um, back in July of 2022. Um, and this program came into fruition through um, that partnership between Heart of Oregon Corps and COIC. Um, and it was originally funded through the Higher Education Coordinating Commission through their Oregon Conservation Corps funding. Um, that funding allowed us to get this program um, off the ground and running 
Um, and as this program has developed, we've added additional funding sources into that, and the OSFM funding is one of those additional funding sources. Um, and um, so this is one of our Heart of Oregon Core um, fuels reduction crews. Um, the Heart of Oregon Core, they have um, crews that work and they're called the High Desert Conservation Corps. Um, this is a mix of positions. They've got crew leaders, they've got land stewardship trainers, um, and they've got youth that work on the crews that are between the age of 18 and 24. Um, they have numerous uh, crews that work on our fuels reduction projects, but these High Desert Conservation Corps crews are the ones that work on um, primarily the fuels reduction projects. Um, and in addition to that, um, Heart of Oregon Corps also has a full-time fuels reduction crew that works on these fuels projects that we work on through the Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership um, exclusively. So they work 40 hours a week on fuels reduction projects um, across the region. And this crew is based out of Redmond. Um, so like I said, this um, the original partnership was created in 2022. Um, and it's been such a neat program to work with because as it was being developed, we wanted to address the you know, overlying um, issue of fuels and overgrowth overgrown fuels in the region. Um, and we wanted to be able to utilize the youth crews that um, we have both in the Youth Compass program at CYC as well as part of Oregon. Um, and we wanted to create a workforce development program that um, sets youth and young adults up in a way that they can go through this program and then be trained and ready to uh, not only know the technical skills of how to do fuels reduction projects on the ground, but also have trainings um, and educational opportunities um, through this program to move into working in fuels reduction, whether that be through uh, a private contractor, working for the Forest Service, um, or working for ODF here locally. Um, we just were seeing a gap and um, in it, in employees that were looking to work in this field. Um, this is one of our, this is our full-time fuels reduction crew um, from last year that worked under Heart of Oregon Corps. And here is a picture of one of the CYC crews. Um, the CYC crews are also getting um, credits, high school credits for the work that they get to do and, um, and their involvement in the training opportunities. Um, our funding through OSFM um, goes towards the boots on the ground work that our crews are able to do. And we've been able to pair that with the funding that we received from the um, Oregon Conservation Corps through HEC. Um, and that helps us to fund additional boots on the ground work and educational opportunities for our youth. Here is a list of some of the partners that um, we've been able to establish in the basin. Um, we work with the Oregon Department of Forestry extremely closely. Um, the Oregon Department of Forestry um, here in our local area, they have two um, wildland firefighters that um, work on fires during the summer and during the winters, both of those, um, they've picked two to stay on with our project through the winter months. So they're, they've been able to turn these positions into full-time positions year round. Um, and during those winter months, um, those ODF employees work on our Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership um, projects. They help us do um, outreach. Uh, they help us uh, put trainings on for the youth. Um, they, they do technical um, skills training out in the field um, and they kind of serve as just an extra set of eyes and expertise in the field while our crews are out um, working on our scope of works um, on these private properties that we work on. We've been able to partner with the Forest Service to 
um, look at the areas that forest surface property overlaps with, within the wild and urban interface um, and address fuels issues um, that are extremely close to private properties. Um, we also um, have partnered with OSU Extension. They have got such an amazing forestry program um, and they've been able to put on educational opportunities for our youth um, to help bolster and answer the questions as to why are we doing this work, where we're doing it. Um, we, of course, partner with um, OSFM. We uh, partner with our local fire and rescue departments, um, our rural fire districts. Um, we have uh, an amazing Project Wildfire program here in Deschutes County, um, and those employees um, help us to locate projects, talk to communities that are Firewise, we work with Firewise coordinators. Um, we work with a lot of individual communities and neighborhoods throughout the region. Um, and that's been an amazing source of project leads for projects that we're, uh, we're working on throughout the area. Um, and of course, we, we partner with a ton of private property owners um, throughout the region. Um, so I want to touch on some of the educational opportunities um, that we've paired with the actual boots on the ground uh, work for this for this program. Um, <clears throat> to date, we have put um, 280 youth um, through through some sort of program revolved around fuels reduction. So. 280 youth have been involved with this program, whether that be through educational opportunities or actually working and serving um, on, on our crews. So our crews are, um, are paid positions um, and um, these youth are a lot of time are in AmeriCorps programs, um, but we've been able to put 280 youth through the programs and the educational opportunities that we've been able to um, to put on because of the folks that we partner with in the community have been incredible. So these pictures are um, were taken from our red card certification program. Um, so a lot of um, the youth and young adults that we're working with um, are sometimes not quite ready to move into a say nine to five uh, position. Um, they are searching for additional training. Um, and uh, a lot of our youth have different abilities and ability levels. Um, so we really try to kind of amplify these training opportunities and get them as much training as we can as they're working their way through um, participating with our crews. Um, so this is an example of where we partnered with both the Oregon Department of Forestry as well as the Forest Service to put on a red card certification program. We have been able to put five of these trainings on and we actually have um, our sixth one coming up next month. Um, so the red card certification program allows these youth to take a week long extensive training in suppressing wildfire. Um, and so we have the Oregon Department of Forestry um, assist in putting this training on and the Forest Service helps put the field day on. Um, this certification is nationally recognized. Um, it, it covers everything from how to read weather, um, fire suppression, wild and urban interface areas. Um, and then they've got a field day that's on the back end of this training. Um, and that's what these pictures are examples of here, where they go through all the tools, um, they actually dig fire line. Um, and this is just one of the many educational opportunities that we uh, like to put our youth through um, so that after they graduate from our uh, workforce program, they have a nationally recognized certification that they can move into the workforce with um, and continue to work in wildfire or fuels reduction um, which they would need that red card certification training for. This is um, just a really neat aerial image. Um, this is on the very last day of their red card training. 
Um, and we try to put 20 youth into the red car trainings each time. And as I said, we're working on our sixth one right now. Um, and this is uh, their field day and their digging line here. Um, they all get really excited to put their uh, wildland firefighting uniforms on and work alongside ODF and the Forest Service to to complete this training. Um, and we have these trainings throughout different times of the year. Um, our most popular training is usually in May, gearing up for fire season. And last May, when we had this, when we put this training on, we 50% um, of the youth that we put through went and continued their wildfire career on and fuel reduction career uh, past this program and worked in uh, wildfire suppression for either private contractors or Forest Service or um, Oregon Department of Forestry after they um, got this certification. So it was really neat to see the youth take this certification and then directly apply it after um, graduating from our program. Um, this is a home ignition zone training that our fuel reduction crews go through. And um, we've been able to put several different iterations of this training on um, with the assistance of OSU Extension, uh, the Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office, and of course, our uh, local fire and rescue stations help to put this on. Um, this really gives the youth that we're working with um, that that information of why we're doing the work that we're doing and why we're doing it in the areas that we're doing. Um, so we're working in high risk wildfire areas. Um, this it, it's really physically demanding work. Um, day in and day out. And so it's really important for us to kind of sit down and take a moment to to show the youth why it is so important that we're doing this work in the communities that we're doing it in. Um, and it's been a really neat experience to watch youth get really interested in in wildfire and fuels reduction through this program and then also implementing everything that they've learned um, on the ground. Um, and so to date, we have treated almost 500 acres. Um, and this is both with the Oregon State Fire Marshal funding and the funding that we received from um, the Oregon Conservation Corps. Um, and we've had 280 youth involved with this, and um, that has um, added up to be over 20,000 hours served in our communities doing fuels reduction work on the ground. Um, so this is a picture of one of the fuels reduction projects um, that COIC was working on. Um, and I wanted to take a moment and highlight um, our partnerships and how that has helped us create our scope of work that we use um, on different projects. Um, so we meet monthly as a, like the Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership puts on a monthly meeting where we sit down with ODF, we sit down with Heart of Oregon Corps representatives, we sit down with the youth, youth workforce development folks at COIC, um, the Oregon State Fire Marshal, uh, local representatives here also attend this meeting and we go over our upcoming projects and we also go over the projects that we've recently completed um, and we look at each scope of work um, and the location that each of our projects are in and make sure that um, we're checking all the correct boxes is this in an underserved community is this an area that we want to be focusing these resources in um, we look at which uh, crews are best suited to do which projects. Um, we do projects um, that are less than an acre and we do some projects that go all the way up uh, to 10 acres, depending on how many structures we're able to, um, to kind of uh, protect and improve through these projects. So um, all of our different crews have different, um, have different abilities or, and are kind of suited better for different projects, but we take a look at all of that in our monthly meetings 
And our partnership with OSFM, as well as the Oregon Department of Forestry, um, really help us in these meetings to kind of steer us in the correct direction and make sure that we're doing projects um, and spending these resources in areas that need it the most. So here is an example before and after um, of one of the projects that we did uh, this summer. And this is one of the first projects that we did um, when we received the OSFM funding for this project. Um, again, the, the OSFM portion of this funding um, solely funds the actual boots on the ground work that these crews are doing. So a lot of times, we are working in and around structures like this and we've got a scope of work document that we've created with um, with the help of um, OSFM and the Oregon Department of Forestry um, here in Central Oregon. And we have combined um, firewise practices. We've com combined the NFPA um, recommended practices and also taken a look at some of the um, state rules and regulations around what they would recommend for fuels. And we've come up with a scope of work document that we take um, out individually to each property owner and we do field assessments on, on each property. And I would say that that is where we partner the strongest with our local um, fire districts as well. Um, those folks are, they are out on the ground every day doing assessments of properties. Um, they are in communication with FireWise coordinators. Um, this picture was taken in Deschutes River Woods. Um, and the they've got FireWise coordinators that are involved um, and know neighbors on a neighbor to neighbor basis. And so once we've made connection with um, the fire districts and they can link us to the FireWise coordinators, we really start to see a steady flow of project leads come in, and that's exactly where this project came from. Um, and we've been really fortunate that while we're working on these projects, um, there's we always get so much interest from neighbors. Um, and so when we're working in these target areas, um, it's not uncommon for us to be approached by the neighbors, um, ask about the program, and then continue to get more potential projects just by uh, word of mouth, but also working with the fireways coordinators. Um, and so the scope of work, uh, as you can see on this one, we're working from that zero to 100 foot uh, buffer around this home. And we are just trying to improve um, the protection of this structure through fuel reduction and removing ladder fuels around the property. So, um, just for liability purpose purposes, you know, our crews are not um, able to, uh, you know, put harnesses on and climb trees or anything like that, and can't do a lot of the limbing in and around structures directly above just for liability purposes. But um, I would say we do a majority of our work uh, between that five and um, 100 foot, where it, you know, just significantly improves. Um, the protectability of that structure in the case of a wildfire so that um, our, you know, emergency services could get in and out and actually um, have a chance of protecting these structures. We also work on some critical infrastructure projects. Um, this is, you know, like cell phone towers, um, water sources. Um, this one was actually at the High Desert Museum um, as a historical site. And this is a before and after photo of, um, of that project that we did uh, two summers ago. Um, this has been an awesome project um, because some of our crews have varying abilities. And so we were able to get several different crews in on this project. We did a significant amount of bitter brush removal. Um, and through this partnership with the, the High Desert Museum, we've been able to get almost all of our crews onto this project um, and they've all worked on different pieces. So um, we have crews that focus on that zero to five um, foot um, area around a structure, uh, removing brush, 
removing pine needles. Um, you know, they would clear the gutters off and then we would move all of that material in and away and off site. Um, and then we had other crews in come in and do seedling removal, bitter brush removal, um, thinning trees out. Um, and these kind of projects have been really neat as well because we produce a lot of material um, and we do have a chipper and a chip truck that we are able to chip all the material and then move that off site. Um, but for the larger wood, we've been able to uh, donate a lot of that wood and also turn it into something that's usable for the community. Um, and we've seen a lot of the wood from these projects go uh, back into the community um, to be utilized during winter months. So that has been really neat to see. So here is a, an example of a partnership that we've got with uh, the Lake Billy Chinook um, Fire and Rescue as well as the Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, this is one of our Heart of Oregon crews, and we were working on a shaded fuels break um, up in and around Lake Billy Chinook. Um, and so this shaded fuel break was um, continuing on from a project that the Fire and Rescue Department had been working on um, for quite a while up here. And this, um, this area experiences um, extreme wildfire risk. Um, and so this was a neat opportunity. We were able to um, send our crew up here and they were able to have an overnight um, camping trip and they were able to stay in the bunkhouse at Lake Billy Chinook and they were able to go through here, limb trees up, remove um, all the bitter brush out from underneath the trees and continue that shaded fuels break on. Um, but something, a piece of our program that we're often not able to do is work with any kind of live fire um, because there's just a lot of liability and risk there. Um, but that's something that our crews get a lot of training on. And so by the end of the program, they are just super excited to see any kind of live fire on the ground. Um, so with this project, um, this has become something that we've done annually with the Lake Deletionuck. Um, fire and rescue is we'll go up there and stay. We'll complete a section of the shaded fuel break and then o in partnership with ODF and um, their volunteer firefighters, we are able to make all the all the piles, uh, the burn piles. And we do this in um, February when we're good to go ahead and light the piles on fire and ODF will come in behind us and, and light those piles on fire. And it's been awesome to see the youth get so excited to um, watch a project come full circle, see the live fire on the ground, and kind of implement some of the trainings that they that they've been able to experience. Um, so I did want to leave uh, quite a bit of time um, to open this up to any questions. Um, I know I moved through that pretty quickly, um, but I just want to emphasize that our program is, is lifted up and amplified by the partnerships that we have in the basin, and it would not be possible without the partnerships that we've been able to um, kind of set into motion and secure um, since this partnership um, began in 2022. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to take a moment and, and answer any questions about different partnerships that we have. I know I touched on a lot of different partnerships, um, but if anyone has questions about um, the crews, the organizations that we work with, the different partnerships that we have, um, or even the setup of our Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership, I'm happy to answer those. Yeah, so uh, as far as questions go, feel free to, you can either type in the chat or you can raise your hand. Yep, we'll have the uh, ability to unmute uh, folks as they raise your hand. So, um, uh, yeah, Cassie, if you wouldn't mind, it uh, looks like we have John is our first question. John, go ahead whenever you're ready. Your mic should be enabled.
And John, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Um, you should be able to hit the uh, unmute button up there on the right upper corner. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, if you want to just type your question in the chat, um, you should be able to get it from there. Lauren, while he's typing his question in, um, I guess I'll start with a question. Uh, what type of outreach do you do to um, uh, or if any to maybe local school districts or local uh, youth around the area, um, or does it all go through um, other other organizations? Yeah, so we we do that all in house, um, and so between Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council and Heart of Oregon, they both have recruitment folks that um, kind of operate differently, but in similar realms. So. Um, I think I said earlier that the Heart of Working Corps works with youth between the ages of 18 and 24. So they're a little bit older than the youth that we're working with at, over here at CYC at the Youth Compass Program. Um, for the Youth Compass Program, those youth are between the ages of 16 and usually around 21 or 22. Um, and a lot of those youth are getting high school credits. So they kind of go about it differently and they're they're working with kind of two different populations except populations of youth and young adults here within central oregon um but they both of these organizations have been working in youth and workforce development for 20 plus years um so they are working with other organizations in the community um and a lot of times they are working with youth that are experiencing um, any number of different barriers, whether that be houselessness, um, working with youth that um, have been involved um, with the justice system, or um, they're working with youth that are in need of credit hours. So they're, they're working with the local uh, community colleges even. Um, that's one, one place that Heart of Oregon uh, does quite a bit of outreach at um, going to job fairs, um, doing those kind of things. But I know that CYC works really closely with the school districts here in Central Oregon, um, working with counselors, um, any number of professionals within those districts to um, potentially identify youth that could benefit from this program. Um, CYC also runs a um, kind of like an alternative education program and a lot of times youth transfer for between that program and working on our crews. Um, Heart of Oregon Corps I know opens their applications up for crew members through AmeriCorps programs as well and so they get a lot of interest in their programs for folks that um, want to move to Central Oregon and work on con conservation projects. Um, so a lot of their crews um, outside of that full-time fuel reduction crew, um, they work on all sorts of different conservation projects. So they're kind of working on our fuel reduction projects here and there, and also working with projects with the Forest Service, building like beaver dam analogs, working on fencing projects. And so those would be the High Desert Conservation Corps um, project positions. And so we see youth come from um, here locally within Central Oregon, but also from all over the country to move and work um, kind of in the field of conservation. So, um, yeah, we see youth come from all over the place for for Heart of Oregon's program. That's great. Sounds like uh, the the wildfire risks here are being uh, shared nationally then through your program too. So, um, thank you. Uh, looks like uh, the question first question we have here is uh, what skills uh, are you able to train youth? Uh, they saw the chainsaw pictures in there. Oh, yeah. Um, great question. Uh, we we try to put on all sorts of training opportunities. And I do 
um, want to emphasize again that the OSFM funding that we're using goes towards boot, boots on the ground, actual fuels reduction in underserved communities and on those private properties. Um, but we've been able to marry that really nicely with the funding that we got from the Oregon Conservation Corps, which helps us to kind of bolster and implement those educational opportunities. Um, so as far as technical skills go, we do an S212 chainsaw certification training. We've partnered with the um, Forest Service as well as Department of Forestry to put those trainings on. Um, and so that is also a nationally recognized certification. So when they move on from our program, they've got that wildland chainsaw certification that they can take with them. Um, and then also having the Oregon Department of Forestry, um, two staff members that work with our crews for six months out of the year, they're, they're on the ground um, implementing those projects and are able to be kind of training during those fuel reduction projects. So we do site assessments. We show the youth how to look at and identify trees. You know, what are we looking at here? How high do we need to limb this tree up? What's going to make this property safer? Um, and and um, internal staff within COIC, so myself or um, folks from part of Oregon um, have been trained through NFPA trainings to do those site assessments. And we try to pass that knowledge on um, to youth and also um, passing that on through the home ignition zone trainings that we put on. Um, and then the Oregon Department of Forestry uh, works a lot with our youth in the field to um, show them how to you know, run the chainsaws, do those different technical skills um, with hand tools as well. Um, and they do that day in and day out on on the different fuels reduction projects that we're doing. And then um, I can't remember all the different um, sub certifications and trainings that they individually take through our red card certification training program, but it's like L180, L190, um, everything that goes into the getting that um, wildfire certification um, that they would need to then fight wildfire, they're all getting those. And that's also been an opportunity um, for that red card training. We open that up to all youth um, within Central Oregon. So we, we don't limit that training to only youth that are already in our program. Um, we actually open up an application process and any youth between the ages of 18 and 26 in Central Oregon that's interested in that training opportunity. Um, we make them a temporary employee for the, that six day training and pay them to get their red card certification program. So we've worked with organizations um, that are working with youth um, um, that have been involved um, in um, like live in um, like live in facilities that youth have been involved um, with the criminal justice system, and we have temporarily um, hired them on to put them into this training so that when they graduate and and are done with that program that they're that they're in, they have workforce um, development opportunities and kind of an avenue for a career moving forward. So we've worked with a lot of different um youth development programs similar to that that's great um one question somebody just would like you to bring up the partner slide again um, when you have a minute um and then um while you're pulling that up something to think about uh, what are the differences that you see in outreach uh, in urban versus rural areas yeah that's a great question um so, so we have the seven target areas, and I wish I would have put um, a map of that into this presentation, um, but I did not do that. Um, and so most of our target areas are not in the most um, populated areas or urban areas, if you will, um, within our region, um, they they are kind of those more rural areas and on the outskirts um, in that that wooey area. So we focus on Lapine, Prineville, Juniper Canyon, Crooked River Ranch, um, Madras, Camp Sherman, and Deschutes River Woods. So these are all um, 
more rural than uh, the Bend area. And these are the areas that we, we focus um, 100% of our projects in. Um, but there, there are differences. Um, but fortunately, when we're working with these rural fire districts or, you know, like Jefferson County Fire and Rescue, they've already done so much of that legwork of doing community outreach, educational opportunities um, on the wild and urban interface that they all kind of have these internal list of folks that are looking for resources. Um, and I would say in some of the more urban areas, um, you know, we've got programs in Deschutes County through Project Wildfire um, and different grant opportunities that some of these larger communities and HOAs have access to because they've got people um, there that are within the HOA or they've got neighborhood associations with people dedicated to finding funding for opportunities like that. And we are looking for kind of the gaps, like who's not able to receive that, who doesn't qualify. Um, and those are the gaps that we're trying to fill with this program and working with underserved communities. Great. Um, one of the questions, and you, you kind of answered this already, but I think the second part we could go on is uh, the, um, what is, is there an outlet for, is this, an, is a program an outlet for troubled youth or anyone interested? And it sounds like anyone, any youth between those age brackets can sign up. Yep. Um, but the second part is uh, what qualifications are required. Um, Sounds like sounds like you can get all your qualifications, but I'll let you. Uh, if there, I don't know, is there any prerequisites or anything that anyone has to have to to get there into the program? There is not. There is not, and it's different between the two the two youth um, workforce programs. So you know, looking back at CYC, if youth are um, in need of high school credits or in an alternative um, education system, this program that that um, those crews work better for youth that are looking for that. Um, and then the youth that work on the Heart of Working Corps crews, um, there aren't necessarily like workforce prerequisites or credentials that you would need to work on these crews, um, especially the entry level positions. Um, and they've got different crews um, that, um, like I was saying before, have different abilities. So we, we also have crews that are part of a program called um, go lead and camp lead. And so this is focusing in on youth with different abilities, um, whether that be learning abilities, um, physical abilities. Um, and it's been really, really awesome to find fuel reduction projects that fit that crew really well. We do a lot of, you know, pine needle removal. We, that crew works a lot in that zero to five zone around structures and that fits them amazingly. And they're able to utilize hand tools um, and do these awesome community projects um, that are you know, protecting structures where other crews are um, doing things all the way up into you know, cutting full-size trees down, doing you know, canopy thinning um, and working with larger trees and that fuels reduction work, or sorry, ladder fuels um, reduction. Um, but as far as the entry level positions, there are no uh, prerequisites that you would need to um, to work for one of these crews as long as you're within um, that age range. Great. Because the whole the you know the whole purpose of this is to provide paid positions to youth that uh, might otherwise come across challenges working in this field. So this is a very entry level. We want to provide as much training in, as possible to to get these youth ready to to move into like a full time position career. Yeah, skills training. So yeah, that's great. Um, next question I have here is kind of a two part question, but do you have any advice on how to sustain those partnerships that are uh, that you're not directly funding and uh, how do you get people to cooperate and show up to the table without directly funding partners? Um, yeah, so what we have found is, and I just wanna preface this, I feel extremely fortunate to work with the partners that we're able to work with here in Central Oregon. There are already so 
many people working on fuels related um, topics, whether it be educational opportunities, actual boots on the ground, fuels reduction work, um, or being resources for people here in Central Oregon. And they're extremely invested in this community and seeing this work done. And I think that they've been able to recognize how the Central Oregon Wildfire Workforce Partnership fills a lot of the gaps that um, some of the resources don't extend into. Um, so, you know, just for example, like we don't necessarily fund anything that Project Wildfire does, but they have people show up to their um, to their meetings all the time in search of a a program similar to um, what our crews do um, to provide cost free fuels reduction work. So um, it's not necessarily that all of our partners are showing up every single day for and being involved with our partnership, but it's kind of that um, the things that they're able to do through the programs that they're already running. Um, they have folks that are looking for a program for fuels free reduction for free fuels reduction work and um, they're able to just do things as simple as like pass things along to us now that they know that we're established in the community. Um, and so many of our partners just send people in our direction and that is so helpful. Like we've been able to establish a, a waiting list of private properties that are uh, that want this fuel extraction work done. Um, but then other partners such as the Oregon Department of Forestry, um, this has been such a mutually beneficial program because they're able to keep two of their wildland firefighters um, on throughout the winter, which creates, you know, um, staff retention. Um, their staff is getting training and working with uh, private landowners, working with these crews, um, building partnerships, working within grant management. Um, so their exposure to some of the stuff that we do um, as well as all the things that they um, provide us with both through trainings and in the field um, work, it's extremely mutually beneficial. Um, and so I would say it's different for each partner. Um, but I think that the one of the main things is that there are already so many people working within fuels reduction in the community and they're very invested and they see where our program fills the gaps that um, weren't previously being filled by um, by resources that were already here. Awesome. Um, the next question I have is what, uh, what do you do with the chipper chips and uh, are there any potential fuels that should not be used for ground cover? Are there any, what was the last part? Um, are there any potential fuel sources that should not be used for ground cover? Yeah, so we have um, <clears throat> uh, two chippers and a chip truck, and we're in the process of um, hopefully purchasing another chip truck. And so these are, this is equipment that our full-time fuels re reduction crew uses at the Heart of Oregon Corps. Um, as well as the High Desert Conservation Corps crews. And um, it's different for, for each property. So because we're running a, vol a completely voluntary program, we're really working on that scope of work with each individual property owner. So some of the property owners um, have, you know, years of experience um, doing burn piles on their, their property. So some of the properties that we do fuel reduction on um, we're actually building small burn piles for the owner to then come through and get rid of that material themselves. Some of our other projects, um, the owners would like to see the material completely removed from the property, and that's where we will bring that chipper chip truck in. It makes it a lot easier for us to transport the material, and a lot more material can be removed from the property quicker. Um, and we use an app um we've got an account with uh chip drop and what we see here in central oregon is there are a ton of folks that own horses um and kind of equestrian farms that utilize that 
that chip. And so when we log on to our chip drop accounts, um, there are folks um, looking for chip to be donated. And we've been able, we've been really, really fortunate. And we've been able to find and donate chip on every single project that we've worked on. Um, we hardly ever have to take uh, material to transfer stations. So um, whether, you know, we're donating firewood or, um, you know, the smaller material we take to folks that have horses most of the time and they utilize that in the horse barns. That sounds, sounds like one of those unique uh, resources out there that once you're in the once you're doing this work, you kind of find those net those neural connections. Uh, that's that's a great resource. Um, do you know if that is a statewide? Uh, I think it is. Or is it local? Okay. I think it is statewide, and it you know it was created by Arborists because I think they often run into the the same issue as once you've finished with a project and you've got you know a ton of of chip where to take that. Um, if you don't necessarily, if you're not close to a transfer station, that can be a big limiting factor in how quickly you can get a, a project complete. And so I do think that chip drop is statewide and you can just Google um, chip drop and you can register. It's a free account um, and it gives you contact information. And I've been able to just call folks, tell them about the program and and find chip drop locations like day of, which has been really, really really nice. Great. I've only got uh, two more questions here. Um, uh, first one is, are you using OSFM survey 123 results to target properties? Um, how does that integrate with your programs, if at all? We um, we have not utilized that yet. Um, we have mostly been working off of the uh, maps that we had originally created, which over overlay that social vulnerability index map with the uh, wildfire risk map and that's what we submitted with our application um, and that's what we've been using um, on our projects and then we've also worked with the oregon department of forestry to um, work with their um, office staff to help us create gis maps to keep track uh, for reporting purposes of where all of our projects are are going on at. Um, and then for our infield use, we use Onyx uh, to keep track of property lines and things like that. Awesome. Uh, last question. Uh, what a great program uh, to help youth that didn't have direct in life and now have a skill or trade and more importantly, a purpose to, to be a contributing member of society. Do you share their success stories in addition to the great work you've showed us in today's slides? We do, yeah. Um, so in the last legislative session, we focused really hard on um, not only the success stories of the community members and the private property owners that we work with, um, but also the youth stories. Um, both have been really, really incredible to work with. And I personally feel, um, and insanely lucky to work with a program like this that we get to um, help youth that are experiencing whatever barrier they may be experiencing to um, finding a career but to watch them get excited about this work and really go through these trainings and get a, a full grasp on hey this is a really cool career opportunity there are jobs available in this and there's even a shortage of workers going into this field. And it, I have a good opportunity at finding a career in this. Um, but watching those youth um, get involved with their communities and do these fuel reduction projects from start to finish, talk to those property owners. I mean, the, the property owners spoil the crew members to death. I'll go out on projects and the property owners will bring out cookies at 10 o'clock in the morning and have our, you know, our youth are just, you know, eating cookies and doing these fuels reduction projects and watching them interact with these private property owners and see the difference that they're making in the community. Um, that's not, that's not something that you can learn in a classroom setting. And it's really when you see those kind of situations unfold um, and watch the youth have that pride and it, Pride for their community and the work that they are contributing to has been really incredible. And the the stories of also the 
private property owners that we work with um, are experiencing whatever hardship it may be, um, but being and working in underserved communities um, has been extremely special for, I know, everyone that's involved with this program and also the youth that are able to experience what their work is doing for people on the ground. Yeah, that's great. I um, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, our, on behalf of our office, we really thank you for the work you guys are doing. It sounds like it's a huge benefit for uh, the community and folks there in Central Oregon. So um, I think that's all we have for questions. Um, thanks again. Uh, really appreciate your work and I'll, I'll yield the rest of that time back to everyone else today. All right. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks.